How do you know what your next step is? How do you find freedom? How do you break through the struggle? What's holding you back? Mediocrity? Opinion? False security? Successes? Hiding who you are? Escape what's stopping you from taking another step forward. Press towards the mark. Keep moving. Destiny calls. Escape to the life Jesus brings. Good morning, church. Welcome to Sunday. So good to be with you this morning. Um, My name's Michael, and I probably know plenty of you, but if if I haven't met you yet, um, I'm Michael. And uh, I've been part of the the Highlands community here for for 15 years now, Uh, initially as a classroom teacher in our college. And for the last five and a bit years, uh, I've had the privilege of of leading the college as principal. which is a really interesting, challenging, exhilarating, terrifying job all rolled into one. Um, But I love it. I absolutely love it because I love our school. And I guess in that role, um, I speak a lot to a lot of people. And um, I can run a staff meeting with 50 staff and not think twice about it. I can talk to an assembly of 500 students and not raise a sweat. Um, Awards night, 1,000 people, heart rate doesn't go up at all. Uh, Last week I spoke to 328 grandparents. Okay, that was a little bit scary (laughs) because I always feel like old people are judging me. Um, But truth is, my parents and my parents-in-law were both in that crowd. And it doesn't matter how old you get, how confident you are, or how um, accomplished you think you might be, the desire to impress your parents never goes away. And so I was feeling that pressure last week. And yet, this morning, uh, I probably feel more out of my comfort zone than I do in any of those scenarios. Um, I may have used the word mildly terrified during the week, which is probably an exaggeration, but it is a little bit scary. And I was trying to think out why. Why is this bothering me so much? And I think there's two reasons. Uh, One is, if you've come from another church to our church, or you've had to visit another church, you will appreciate that the quality of teaching and preaching in this place is absolutely amazing. And when we live in that bubble, that becomes the normal for us. Um, But if you've had to go to another church for a christening or a wedding or or something like that, you go, oh, this is okay, but what we have is absolutely brilliant. And so I feel like I've got some big shoes to fill this morning. Um, But um, Ken and Doug are both away in the States, and they are incredible teachers who bless us every week. Um, And I mention that because they're probably tuning in online from the States now, so... (laughs) I'll talk you up, boys. Um, But more poignantly, I think why I'm uh, out of my comfort zone this morning is because this really matters. Uh, That other stuff, I might look like a goose if I get it wrong. I can live with that. But this, this is the Word of God. This is life-changing stuff. This is where it's at. And um, and so I absolutely want to get that right. When Doug asked me about a month ago if if I'd preach today, um, I said, yep, sure, absolutely. He said, we're doing a series on escape. Can Can you preach on escape? I went, yep, I can talk all about escape. And he went, oh, and it's Mother's Day. And I went... How do I put escape and Mother's Day together (laughs) without offending someone? Um, (laughs) But he must have seen the uh, the puzzled look on my face and went, I don't need you to preach on Mother's Day, I'm just telling you that it is Mother's Day. (laughs) Okay, so I'm really glad that Ben um, honoured our our mums this morning and I just want to reiterate that as well. Mums are the backbone of our society and often the unsung heroes. And particularly too, I just want to honour those women who may not be mums, but they mother. And obviously in my context, I've got female staff who don't have kids of their own for whatever reason, and yet I see them fill the role of mother every week and do it incredibly well. So I want to honour them too today. Thank you. I'm sure you at some stage in your life have thought about escaping something. Um, You were probably at work. You'd probably had enough. And you started the sentence like, wouldn't it be nice if? And you've sort of drifted off into that fantasy place where you've taken off your tie and thrown it at the boss and and stormed off. Or you've had that argument with someone and you've said just the right thing to show them and you walk off triumphantly into the distance. Um, But we've all wanted to escape something at some stage in our life, I'm sure. I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb there by suggesting that. When we're talking about escape, what we're really talking about is finding freedom. It's actually finding that place where we can be 
truly free. But um, I think there's some challenges around that that we often don't unpack and we often don't think through. How do you find freedom? How do you break through the struggle? How do you let go or overcome the past? Because we live in a really freedom-focused world. Um, That's why there's wars going on most of the time. People are fighting for freedom. Uh, Every generation has its freedom songs, doesn't it? The Israelites were singing freedom songs when they were in exile. Um, It's no different in this day and age. You listen to any popular music and there's a whole genre genre of music um, seeking freedom. And I often wonder if those people, those artists, actually know what it is they're seeking or what that freedom looks like. So I think the first thing, if we're going to talk about escape into freedom, is we need to know and be really clear on what we're escaping from. And you might be sitting there this morning and already had a bunch of ideas of, I'd like to escape from this, or I'd like to be free of that. Um, Is it the rat race? Is it boredom? Is it debt? Or is it just hopelessness? Maybe you want to escape from that. Um, Is it boredom? You know, boredom's a funny thing. You can be incredibly busy and bored at the same time. Um, And I've been there. I remember five or six years back in my role, I'd hit that point where something that used to be challenging, you kind of get good at and then it becomes mundane and then you sort of get sick of it and you go, I'm still incredibly busy, but I'm actually bored. (laughs) I want some excitement. I want some new challenge in my life. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. Or maybe it's one of those big ones like addiction. And when we talk about addiction, often people think to oh, alcoholism, drug addiction, there's a bunch of other things you could throw in there. But I guess I'd like to challenge you a little bit this morning around what's your definition of addiction? Because those things are really obvious, but I think when we break it all down, being under addiction is, have something, is about having something that has control in your life. Who's in control? And if there's anything there at all which is shaping the way that you live, or more importantly, stopping you from doing what you know you should be, that's really an addiction. It could be television. Um, I know we all watch Netflix now, but you know, back in the day when you actually watch live TV <laughs> with those terrible ads and everything else, um, you know, if there's a weekly show and it just happens to fall on Tuesday night and you're going, I really feel called to go to prayer and praise, but that TV show's on and I can't let that go, what's in control there? Is it the Lord or is it a TV show? Could that be addiction? I don't know. That's just where my mind went when I was thinking about that. What or who is in control of your life? And if it's anything other than what it should be, that's probably something we need to escape from. So what does the Bible say we need to escape from? It's a pretty good reference point to start, I believe. So if we have a look at John chapter 8, verse 32 to 36, it says this, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we're descendants of Abraham, they said. We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean we'll be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Same themes picked up again in Romans, chapter 6, 18 to 22. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using this illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living, so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You were now ashamed of the things you used to do. Things that in the end, things that end in eternal eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. There's a pretty clear theme coming through there, isn't there? What we are actually enslaved to is sin. It is sin that prevents us living in true freedom. And all those things we listed out before, be it addiction, be it control, be it any of those things, be it debt even that are oppressing us, I think when we break it all down, they all originate in sin. And sin's not a word we tend to use all that much more in 2019. Obviously, very occasionally, uh, as principal, I've got to deal with kids who are in trouble. 
You'd be surprised how little that happens in, in our context, but when it does, and they walk in and they sit down, I don't go, you sinned. <laughs> we just don't use that kind of language. We have a conversation around behaviour and that kind of thing. And so it's not a word we tend to use much anymore unless it's in a joke. Um, you know, oh, I sinned on the weekend. That was a bit of fun. Or um, <laughs> we even... Um, refer to the tax on alcohol and tobacco as sin tax um, because we th- you know, it, it, it's a bit of a joke, but sin's serious. And sin is not things that we do, it's actually who we are. And that becomes a real problem because there's no one here who hasn't sinned because you were born into it. And we could spend a whole hour unpacking the how and why of that, but the reality is we live in a fallen world where sin is prevalent and so you have been born into a state of sin. Sin's not what you do, it's your condition. And if we were to leave this right here, that'd be really depressing. It'd be a pretty messed up place to finish. (laughs) But unfortunately, it's not. And I think it's really important if we're going to escape that it's not just what we're escaping from, but we need to talk about what we're escaping to. That's really critical because that's what completes the journey, if you like. Um, As I was reflecting on this during the week, I thought of two people groups who perhaps struggle with this a little bit. Firstly, prisoners. Um, People who spend time in prison obviously are enslaved. They are not free. Prison is kind of the opposite of freedom, if you like. And how often do we see that people escape from prison or are even released from prison and find that they can't cope with society beyond that? Because they've been so focused on their escape, they've been so focused on their release that they haven't actually thought through what life's going to look like on the other side. The other people group I thought of were lotto winners. Any lotto winners here? I didn't think anybody would put their hand up. Um, (laughs) But we see that time and time again. People who come into money suddenly or unexpectedly, and maybe it's not even the lotto, maybe it's an inheritance or something like that. Suddenly they're free from financial burden uh, and they don't know what to do with that freedom. Because they haven't had the discipline, the time, the opportunity to think through what they're going to do with that, it fritters away and it disappears. And the rate of bankruptcy um, amongst lotto winners is phenomenally high because they haven't thought through what the next step is. And I think that's really critical if we're going to escape um, from our sin state into something new. So what is freedom? We probably need to define that as well. And I'm not going to go to popular culture songs for that. I'm not going to talk to my mate at the pub. I'm actually going to get into the word and go, what does it mean to be free? And I saw a documentary during the week um, around mountain climbing and endurance sports and all that kind of thing. And and this this French, Spanish, can't remember, European um, mountain climber was interviewed and they said, why do you climb mountains? And he said, for the freedom. And the interviewer said, well, what does it mean to be free? And he said, To be truly free is to be able to make my own choices, make my own decisions. And I went, no, (laughs) that might sound like freedom, but that's not freedom as far as I can tell. Because if I was free to make all my own decisions, to choose my own destiny, I can't see that going terribly well. Because I've made plenty of choices in the past that have not led me towards freedom. (laughs) They've led me towards bondage, to slavery, the opposite of freedom because I don't have it all figured out. Why would I seek to make my own decisions when there is one who has not only created me, but mapped out a glorious future, plans and purpose for me? I trust him over myself, because I'm fallible and I'm broken, and I was born into that sin nature. So I think we're pretty clear that we've got something to escape from. We are all sinners who need the freedom from sin. We need to know where we're going to and what that looks like, and that's what we're going to unpack this morning. So the question is how? You know, if we don't find freedom in the world and we don't find freedom in making our own decisions, where do we start? We start with Jesus. And there's no way to ease into that. It just is what it is. Jesus has got to be the starting point of our freedom because Jesus came to free us. That was his purpose and our freedom can only be found in him. If it's sin that's preventing us from freedom, the only one who can give us that freedom is the only one who's conquered sin and death and that's Jesus. He came to earth, he died on that cross, 
He rose again so that we can not only be free from sin, but walk in that freedom for all of eternity. And that excites me very, very much. You know, it's funny, people often reject Christianity in my experience um, because they're worried about the rules. They see Christianity as a rule set that they've got to abide by and they see Jesus as a killjoy who's putting those boundaries in place to stop them having fun, to stop them having a full life or to stop them having freedom. And they've absolutely got it round the wrong way because freedom can only be found in him. If I can use a metaphor to try and help explain this to you, Obviously, my context is education. Um, that's where I've spent 20-something years, and in Christian education particularly. And um, every school has a set of school rules. You've got to have them. But um, the problem with rules is, as soon as you... Firstly, you can't put rules in place for everything because you can't predict what um, people are going to do. And kids particularly can be particularly creative in their rule-breaking. But the trouble with human nature is, as soon as you put a rule in front of someone... They will look for a way around it. We have a tax system based on that. Um, that, that, that that's how that works. And so um, you can put as many rules in place as you like, but you're never going to come um, cover all eventualities. And you're basically, particularly with children, inviting them to find out a way to, to get what they want without breaking a rule. So we have school rules. They sit there. But what we put in front of that is something called an honour code. We say, honour God, honour others, Honour yourself. And what that does is it takes the focus off the rules and puts the focus on a better way to live. And I love that because I don't have to sit in my office um, with a child going, you broke rule 6.2, subsection B. <laughs> they didn't know that existed. But I just say, hey, what you did there, is that honouring God? No, nah, it's not. Well, let's talk about that and let's talk about how we can make that right so you can honour God, honour others and honour yourself in that situation. And that's what Jesus did. As a new Christian, uh, and for a lot of my life, I struggled with why Jesus had to come and die. But, all right, God, you set up this system. You wanted us to, um, to be free. Um, you could have just you know, dropped Jesus in it and waved a magic wand. Or you could have dropped Jesus in and he could have just... Come down, died, rose again, and off he, again. off he went. But no, Jesus came to, to, chose to come and live with us for 33 years uh, in order to do that. And I finally figured out, you all figured this out a long time ago, but I finally figured out that the reason that he did that was to model what it looks like to walk in freedom. So he didn't just come to give us the freedom, he actually hung around and showed us what it looks like to walk in that. And that really excites me. Um, one of my favourite authors, uh, probably 10 or 15 years back, was a guy called Philip Yancey, um, uh, an American, and he's written a bunch of books. Um, but one of his less known works is a, it was called I Was Just Wondering, and it's a, a bunch of short essays where he just puts his thoughts on paper uh, about his wonderings uh, about life and the universe and everything else. And he wrote something really impacting um, about his aquarium. He was living in urban Chicago at the time and it was really high density and not particularly attractive. So he established an aquarium in his apartment uh, to remind him what the universe looked like outside of high density living. And so he had this beautiful aquarium and he put in plants and coral and exotic fish and all sorts of creatures and he tended to that. He checked the pH, he'd feed that fish this and this fish that and he'd put antibiotics in when they... The bug-eyed fish got gunky eyes and all the rest of it. And he cleaned the tank and he poured everything into making that perfect for looking after those fish. He was their carer and he did everything he could to keep them alive and give them a great life. And yet every time he reached his hand into that tank, the fish scattered. <laughs> they'd go and hide behind their, um, their rocks or they'd go, go hide in the seaweed. And he went, how is it that I can pour my heart and soul into these fish and yet every time I approach the tank, they scatter in fear. He said, the only way I could do that, the only way I could get through to them is to become a fish and swim around in the tank within them. And that was the image he gave of what Jesus did for us. He didn't just want to free us and look after us. He wanted to come and dwell amongst us and have a relationship with us, which I think is incredible. So we need Jesus, absolutely. He is the starting point of all our freedom. What Jesus did in spending time with us is he showed us how important relationship is. He wanted to relate with us, but he was also modelling 
how we need to relate to each other because we become those we surround ourselves with. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of parents here this morning and I'm sure one of your biggest priorities in life is making sure that your kids hang out with the right people. Uh, we, I often talk to parents, you know, why Highlands College? And they say, because of the quality of your kids. We don't want our kids to fall in to the wrong crowd. We want them to be like those kids that we see at Highlands. And that's what we want because we know that particularly at that impressionable age, um, we become like those we surround ourselves with. But it's no different as adults. The people we spend time with rub off on us and we become like them. So if I'm going to seek freedom, I want to hang out with freedom seekers. And that's why church is so critically important. Um, I don't teach much anymore in the classroom, but I do take Year 12 Christian Studies. And we're looking at the concept of the church at the moment, its history, its purpose, its function. And this week we're going to be asking the question, do I actually need to go to church? So sorry, spoiler there for anyone in my Year 12 Christian Studies class. Because every year someone will say, can I be a Christian and not go to church? And I use this metaphor. Probably technically yes. But that's saying, that's like saying I want to go to Melbourne, but I've never been there before. I don't own a car. I don't have a GPS or a map. And I'm not even sure if I have a car. <laughs> Technically, it's possible, but good luck to you. <laughs> it could, it's going to be a really tough journey. And I guess that's how I view our walk as Christians. Is it technically possible to be a Christian and not go to church? Yeah, it is. But why would you want to when you've got this, when you've got people who can walk the journey with you? Because really Christianity and the Christian walk to me is about going, Jesus is over there, I'm heading that way, will you come with me? And if we're all going arm in arm, we've got a much better chance of arriving at our destination than if we fly solo. I think the other thing that's really important about relationship is accountability. And I don't know if anyone likes being accountable. It's probably not something that we get excited about. But accountability is so incredibly important. We need people in our lives who can speak into us and, yes, encourage us when we're doing well. Okay, words of affirmation is my love language. Give me a bunch of flowers, I go, yeah, whatever. Tell me I'm doing a good job and I'll get months out of that because <laughs> that's just my love language. That's what works for me. But um, more challenging but more important is having those people in your life who will say to you, you didn't get that right. Or I can see the path you're going down. Are you aware of that? Um, if you are brave enough to surround yourself with those people, you are going to flourish and you are going to have a much better chance of walking in that freedom that Jesus has given us. But I'll also just have a little caveat there and make sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right people. I actually saw something on Facebook of all places yesterday that said, um, never take criticism from anyone you wouldn't go to advice for. Because everyone's got an opinion and from time to time there will be those people in your life who well-meaningly want to tell you you're doing the wrong thing, but that's not okay. And I guess that's where some discernment's required. And again, that's why I'd rather be here getting accountability from you guys than getting advice from someone down the pub. Not that I go to the pub, but you know. It's the first thing that popped into my mind. I'm going to pull something up on the screen now called the Jahari window. And you may or may not have seen this before. This is a tool that psychologists use to help us understand ourselves. So I'm going to get a little bit teacherish. Um, but it's really around the concept of self-awareness. And you'll see at the top across there, we've got known to self, not known to self. And down the side, we've got known to others, not known to to others. And where those, those uh, axes intersect, we get some really interesting stuff happening. Uh, top left there, things that are known to others uh, and known to self, we call the open area or the arena. Everyone knows it. Um, I can't sing. I really wish I could. I'm a man of many talents, but singing isn't one of them. Uh, I'm terrible. I know that. You know that. My family knows that. Um, there's been more than one occasion where my wife has come rushing in going, you okay? And I went, yeah, I'm just singing. She's like... <laughs> Right, <laughs> got it. Uh, I wish I'd made that up, but I hadn't. Um, so that's the top left. That's not a big deal. That's public knowledge. Bottom right, we've got known, not known to self and not known to others. Well, there's not much to say about that because we don't know anything about it. But you could think of that as potential. Those things that you haven't discovered about yourself yet, other people haven't seen in you, but they're sitting there, uh, good or bad, um, yet to be discovered. But it's the other two squares I want to talk about this morning. If you look at the top right there, we've got not known to self, but known to others. 
That's what we call the blind spot, the thing that everyone else knows about us but we haven't figured out for ourselves yet. And you can probably think of situations where everyone's like, oh, what about such and such? Is this, this and this? And he's got no idea. Can he not see that he's doing that? And the answer is no, he can't because we all have those blind spots. And that's where it gets really dangerous trying to walk the journey with, uh, to freedom of Christianity on our own because we can't see our own blind spots. It's really important that we've got quality people who can speak them out. So relationship is really critical. That bottom left square leads me to the third point I want to talk about this morning, and that's honesty. Honesty with self. So we need to accept that Jesus has already granted us freedom. We need quality people in our life who are also freedom seekers walking the journey with us. But we also need to be brave enough to look inward and, uh, and to self-reflect reflect a little bit. And that, um, that bottom left square there is the things that we know about ourselves that others don't necessarily know. And we all have those things, those things that we're happy for other people not to know, those secrets, or it could even be doubts about ourselves. Um, there's something called imposter syndrome, and I have it all the time as a principal. I'm sitting there going, everyone tells me I'm doing a good job. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but um, they think I'm doing a good job, so that's okay. Um, but often it's those things too that are uh, the dark places, those addictions we spoke about, those things that are bondage, we might know about them and other people don't. And we need to be prepared to be honest and to self-reflect. And when those people who we've surrounded ourselves speak into our life, actually acknowledge it and do something about it. Because it's no good having people going, you really need to pick your socks up here. And then you go, nah, I'm fine. Nothing wrong with me. I'm perfect. Uh, we're not going to get anywhere. Finally this morning, if you've heard nothing else, I'm really hoping that you will listen to this. Because Jesus just didn't come to free us and to show us a better way to live and then go, see you later, I'm out of here. That would be cruel because life is tough and he doesn't expect us to do that journey um, as humans without some help. He actually gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, to be the inner voice in that journey. And even as a Christian, it took me a long time to figure that out. And I think a lot of us are still trying to figure that out. And there's probably people here this morning who are going, I know Jesus. I've made that decision. I've accepted the freedom that he brings, but I still feel trapped in some of those things that are enslaving me. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in because he serves two purposes, or at least he has in my life. One of those is conscience. It's that small, quiet voice that speaks to us and guides us. And I don't think we ever do things that walk us away from freedom accidentally. I think if we're prepared to listen, because the Holy Spirit doesn't shout, he whispers. But if we're seeking him and we're willing to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, there's that voice that goes, you don't want to go there. That's not the right thing to do. Um, the world calls that conscience. We've all seen the cartoons with you know the devil on this shoulder and the angel on this shoulder having an argument. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit in work, at work in us, gently get, guiding, leading and teaching. So the Holy Spirit plays that role of conscience, which is so incredibly important if we want to walk in the freedom that Jesus has given us. I think the other role that the Holy Spirit plays, at least in my life, is calling. And that's what links back to that idea of what are we escaping to? We're escaping from something, but what are we escaping to? And that's where I don't want to be master of my own destiny. I don't want to be making my own choices because I know that I've been created for a purpose. And if I try and walk any other path, it's going to be difficult. One of the things that frustrates me um, is when parents or teachers or careers counsellors, whoever, ask the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I scrap that question, I band it. I say, who do you think God's calling you to be? What do you think God's calling you to? Because I know for me, it took me 20 years to figure that out. And I believe I'm where God wants me to be now, but the journey would have been a lot clearer and a lot straighter if I'd been asking that question, not trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. Because I believe the Holy Spirit is the means by which God calls us to what it is that we need to do. 
If I could finish just by sharing a little bit of a story this morning. I was teaching a Christian studies class um, no, six or seven years ago, and um, it was year eight. We were looking at heroes of the faith. So we're talking about Daniel, we're talking about Gideon, we're talking about Josiah, we're talking about all these people. And, and it struck me that most of these people were probably the same age as these 13-year-olds that I was teaching at the time. And I still distinctly remember that where I slipped from teacher mode into preacher mode. I got all fervent, the arms were going, the spit was flying, the kids down the front were like this. <laughs> But I was so passionate because I just had this moment where these kids just needed to know that you don't have to wait till you're older. You don't need a theology degree or a teaching degree or a medical degree. Um, In fact, quite often I think those things get in the road of God's plans and purposes for our lives because suddenly we think, I can do this. I know what I'm doing. I'll be all right. It's a cliche, but God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. And so I'm fervently trying to get this across to these kids. And I've never actually heard the audible voice of God, but I reckon this is the closest I've ever been. It was as if this voice went, are you listening? I completely lost my place, couldn't get it back together. The kids are like, what's going on? Is he having an aneurysm? Um, And I just thought, where did that come from and what did that mean? But I eventually pulled myself together and um, got on with the lesson and forgot all about it. Three months later, the then principal of the college, called me up on a Saturday and said, can I take you out for coffee? And I'm like, okay, that's strange, but why not? So we went out for coffee and he said, Michael, I need to let you know I'm resigning. And instantly, that moment in that lesson came back to me and I went, oh no, no way, this can't be happening, possibly not. Because it wasn't something I had sought at all. And if I'd been operating in my own strength, thinking my own path, I would have run a mile but I knew it was the Holy Spirit tapping on my shoulder going, get ready for this. And I'm so glad I had that moment because being a principal is actually a difficult job. Um, It's harder than you you think in a lot of ways. And it's incredibly rewarding, but I could never do it in my own strength. And so many people say, oh, you know, do you have dreams of a bigger school or this or that? And I go, no, I don't want to be principal anywhere but here. And I didn't even want to be principal here um, in the sense that I didn't seek it out. But I just love this place. I love what God's doing. I could see what God was trying to do. And I thought, Lord, I just want this to happen. If I can be a part of that, so be it. And I think what happens is when you find your calling, the final stage of that is anointing comes. And anointing is not something we talk about a lot, but it's so incredibly powerful. And if you can walk in the freedom of what you've been called to and that anointing comes on you, it doesn't make life easy. It doesn't mean you won't have challenges, but it gives you this confidence. And I come into every day going, Lord, if I try and do this on my own, it's not going to work. But I know you've called me. I know you've anointed me. I'm trusting that you're going to do your thing. And I just get to be a spectator and enjoy the ride and help out where I can. And that's what I want for you today. I want you to walk in the freedom of knowing who you've been called to be, And better yet, to have that anointing over your life, that you know that you are in the right place. Now, I might get called out to something else at some other time, and that's fine. I'll do that, and the anointing will come on me for that. But right now, I know where I need to be. And my prayer for you this morning is that you know where you need to be. And that mightn't just be career-wise. That might be um, something to do with lifestyle. It might be a relationship. It could be anything that makes up the rich tapestry of life. Know that you are free. The price has been paid. Know that there are people around you who want to support you in that journey and be a part of it with you. Be brave enough to look inside and go, am I being real with myself? And then seek the Holy Spirit with all your heart to know that calling and know that anointing. As we wrap up this morning, um, it might be that you're sitting here going, Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't even know who this Jesus is, but I want to walk in freedom. And it sounds like that might be the way to get there. And if that's you, I would encourage you to explore Jesus, to ask the questions, to surround yourself with people who are already on that journey and ask them to be a part of your life. Or it might be that you've accepted Jesus. You know that you're free, but your life doesn't feel free. It doesn't feel like you're walking in that freedom. And you need to maybe go down that journey of going, Holy Spirit, what do I need to do to walk in that freedom? So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes this morning. 
and bow your head. And you might be in either of those two scenarios. So I'm going to encourage you. If you don't know Jesus, maybe you know of him. We've heard that before. Maybe you know of him, but you don't know him. Now is a great opportunity to go, Jesus, I want to meet you. Or maybe you're like I was for a long time. I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm free. My life doesn't feel free because I'm still trying to figure it out on my own. Maybe that's you. If either of those two uh, descriptions, either of those two scenarios are you this morning, would you be brave enough to raise your hand? I'm not going to ask you to come out the front. I'm not going to ask you to, to make any public declaration. But just as a way of, of committing, I see that hand. That's so incredibly awesome. There may be others here this morning who are just, just sensing that they need to take that next step in their journey towards that complete freedom. Is there anyone else here this morning? That's so fantastic. I'm going to pray with you and um, maybe you put your hand up, maybe you didn't. But would you just tune in while I pray? Let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you so much for what you did, that you were willing to come to this earth and dwell amongst us to show us a better way to live, that you were prepared to die, to go through a painful death on the cross, to pay for the price of our sin, but then rise gloriously so we could have eternal life with you. We are thankful. thankful thank you for sending your Holy Spirit, Lord, because we're not in this alone. Thank you for that guidance and that leadership that you provide in our lives. Father God, I just pray for those who are making that decision right now, Lord, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you'd empower them, and Lord, you would surround them with the people that they need to walk this journey into freedom with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.